Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks very much for joining us for our uh, next edition of the COVID Community Practice for Family Doctors. I'm Dr. Tara Karen. I'm a family doctor at the St. Michael's Hospital Academic Family Health Team. And I'm also the vice chair for Department of Family Community Medicine at uh, the University of Toronto, and I'll be your host today. Um, we're delighted to, of course, bring this community of practice together uh, with our colleagues at the Ontario College of Family Physicians. And to that degree, I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer Young. Jennifer, you're muted. Of course. Good morning, everybody. It's wonderful to be here once again, sharing the learnings that you all have, have been putting into practice over the last uh, challenging months. Um, and I'm very happy to collaborate with the Department of Family and Community Medicine from U of T and the Ontario College of Family Practice. Um, we are looking at changing the way we work. Um, today, we're talking about ramping up in in-person visits in primary care and we have a couple of very practical people who will be speaking with you as well as myself and and David Kaplan answering your questions over the next hour but before we get started I would like to begin with a land acknowledgement and in that we acknowledge that the land on which we are meeting um, and hosting this is the traditional territory of many nations. We acknowledge that Ontario is home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples, and that each of you are joining us from one of those many traditional and treaty territories. We are grateful to be able to come together in this way. Thanks, Jennifer. I always find the land acknowledgement is a great time for us to reflect um, on the injustices that uh, continue to be faced by Indigenous people. And of course, the last few weeks have um, been a reminder of um, how racism exists in our society, in our police force, and in healthcare against uh, our Black population and also our Indigenous population. Um, I know part of being a strong ally means for us to educate ourselves on the history of Indigenous people um, their experiences, uh, their perspectives. And to that degree, I, for those of you who haven't done it already, I would, I would highly recommend the Ontario Indigenous Cultural Safety Program. Um, I did it myself about a year ago and uh, found it to be great, uh, great learning. Um, it is offered uh, continually now, I think for about $300 per seat. And we've included the link there that we'll share. Next slide. So today, of course, we're bringing together a wonderful group of people to talk about um, how we can strike the right balance between in-person visits and virtual visits, uh, given all that's going on. And I think that the timing of this topic is, is, uh, is, is, is really perfect, given that today is actually the reopening for many regions in Ontario, um, but, not, uh, but not others. Um, we've been bringing you this community of practice for a few weeks now, and. Uh, Every time, it's, a, it's an opportunity for us to learn from each other. We're, we don't necessarily all have the answers, um, but I know all of us have knowledge that we can share to help us to get through this. Um, uh, for those of you who've missed it, um, our previous sessions can be found at the website link below. Uh, and it includes um, not just the webinar, but also some important resources. Next slide. Um, so I just want to give a shout out to our planning committee who have uh, really been the driving force behind this and, and who select the speakers that we're hearing from on a regular basis. Next slide. Um, and today we've got a great panel, as I mentioned, and I'm just going to get them to introduce themselves one at a time and speak to their conflicts of interest. Next slide. Cindy. Hi, my name is uh, Sandeep Banwas. Um, I have no real conflicts, but I do sit on the board with the Ontario College of Family Physicians and received another area from them. I practice in a fee-for-service practice in Mississauga, Ontario. Thanks, Sandy. Kelly? Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Kelly Scott. I'm a family physician in St. Thomas, Ontario in a, a small foe, a four-physician foe. Uh, it's part of a family health team, and I, um, I'm also an Ontario MD peer leader um, and I am a pandemic planning lead for our subregion in Ontario Health West, so I do receive some financial support from them. And uh, I also um, uh, am a, on the medical advisory board for babycenter.ca and the OCFP with um, honoraria from there. Thank you. Um, so I myself um, uh, do have some research grants and funding 
um, uh, all of whom are from nonprofit uh, organizations, except for Gilead Sciences, uh, where I received a grant to study um, curing Hep C in primary care. David? Hi, I'm David Kaplan. I'm a family doctor uh, in North York. Um, I have received some uh, speaker honoraria from the Ontario College of Family Physicians, uh, but I'm also the Chief of uh, Clinical Quality at Ontario Health in the Quality Branch, uh, which was formerly the agency known as Health Quality Ontario. Jennifer? And I'm uh, Jennifer Young. I'm a community family physician in Collingwood, Ontario. I'm presently the president of the Ontario College of Family Physicians. I have no grant research or uh, support, but uh, have received honoraria from the OCFP. Great. Um, so, and of course, uh, in addition to our panelists and guests, um, we found that um, you, our attendees, are a huge part of what makes this community of practice um, uh, so great. Um, so just a reminder of how to participate. Um, if you have questions uh, for the panelists, we really recommend putting those questions in the Q&A box. So type your question in there and we'll either answer it by typing the answer or by um, uh, 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 um, answering the question live. And in terms of, um, you know, if you want to add things to the comments, uh, because you've got great resources to share or tips, uh, we love that and we really encourage you to do that in the chat uh, section. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our first speaker, um, Dr. Sandeep Banwat. Now, Sandeep, you mentioned you work in a fee-for-service practice in Mississauga, and um, I can only imagine how challenging it's been over the last few weeks to um, adapt. We've heard from lots of people adapting their practice, et cetera. What, are, what have been some of the things that um, you've done to try and um, take the right balance between in-person and virtual visits, and what are some of the things you're thinking about as we think about uh, ramping up in-person visits in primary care? Thank you, Tara, and uh, thank you for having me on. Um, it's a bit of an understatement to say that it's been a challenge in fee-for-service, the fee-for-service world. Um, however, keeping kind of the business side of it um, just to the side for a moment, um, you know, the medical side has been like a constant PDSA cycle every month, every week, you know, every day, um, patient to patient. Um, and I don't... I don't personally, and some others have told me, like the term reopening um, or primary care because my office is never closed. Uh, we may have changed the way we did things. Um, and I like the phrasing that we're reinventing what we're doing more so than reopening or ramping up. We're just reinventing what we're doing. Um, for me, it's all about, it all kind of bundles into safety at this point um, for our patients, for our staff, for our families, for ourselves and for the public and everything has been in the context of COVID-19 and then changing how we practice has all been about information kind of overload at times and trying to find where we get the right information. Um, I must say that patients have been exceptional in their understanding and they, they trust us to provide their care as their family docs, um, but it's been a challenge um, at times to try to bridge the information and try to communicate that with patients while we're trying to do everything on, on our own side. Um, so a couple of practical suggestions, because I, I think there's going to be a lot of um, questions in this um, webinar today, so I'm going to keep it short. Just three small examples, kind of the regular kind of PDSA that runs through my head all the time. Um, one is just on workflow. Um, a simple thing when we started, when we moved from, you know, there's only one doc in the office now, so sometimes we're at home making calls and sometimes we're in the office, is that, you know, our numbers are now private or unlisted, and when you call patients, they don't pick up private callers. Um, phone numbers anymore. So my wife doesn't even pick up mine because it's changed to a private caller. So um, just reminding patients that if the doc calls, it might be an unlisted number and to pick up the phone because it just interrupts workflow very quickly. Um, also, a lot of cell phones are preset to be silenced or, or, or um, block um, incoming calls from private callers and it goes right to the voicemail so that I'm leaving a message and then they're calling back my staff and then my staff is calling me to recess and it's just kind of a loop, on a, especially on the telephone. So just sending them um, the information on how to unblock or unsilence their cell phones um, has been a huge improvement so we're not missing uh, or interrupting workflow. Um, the other one that's been uh, always uh, is PPE and I have a small kind of uh, slide here on what's called the glove pyramid by the WHO. And Brian, if you could put that slide up. Um, it's essentially 
always the question of what PPE are we wearing? And I think we're going to get to that from another speaker um, at the end. But it was just putting this up just so I don't have to go back and look over and over again. It reminds the staff and the people and even um, patients that, you know, a simple tool of visualization rather than going through a, through a structured kind of box um, spreadsheet of what to do. And I like simple tools, like practical tools um, at the end of the day. And this was one that uh, we had put up uh, originally. The other one um, was about physical flow through the office and workflow. And uh, Brian, if you can set up to the next slide. Um, this was something, uh, Six Sigma Lean Process, that I was shown when I did my master's in public health a few years ago. Um, and it's a spaghetti flow diagram, which is really a process analysis tool. And it really is helpful about tracking flow and, 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 and our looking at motion waste, um, as it's called. And it's, in this context for us, it's really about the areas of occupational safety. And the blue lines there are the docks um, moving through this, the, the office. And the orange ones, for in this example, are the patients that's coming through and how to watch, as we know, surface contamination and interaction and person to person and how we can move and maneuver that. So this is another simple tool that helped me kind of narrow down the energy I have for other things and help me have more energy for other things to be more um, reasonable about it. And what I'm hearing and needing and my colleagues are saying and the questions that were sent um, for this webinar is that we're just looking for some practical, simple advice from a trusted source. And I hope that from the rest of the seminar and today we can provide that for you today. Thank you, Tara. Thanks, Sandeep. I mean, I think what you've articulated is that you're, you've been seeing patients, of course, like many of us, um, all through this. And, you know, this is uh, going to be just increase potentially in that volume. And these are some of the practical tools um, that are supporting you. Um, so if you guys have questions for Sandeep, um, please put them on the Q&A or the chat. And in the meantime, I'm going to turn it over to you, David. Because, um, uh, David, I know you have a re leadership role at Ontario Health quality, um, but you're also, of course, also um, a leader in your own practice. And I know you guys have developed some um, great tools uh, and uh, have some advice for others around when we're thinking about ramping up in-person visits. Yeah, absolutely. So we thought it was really important, just like uh, Sandeep mentioned, to think about what our patients need to know about the, the now normal or the new normal. I'm not sure if it's the new or the now. Uh, and um, so one of the things we've done is we've we really tried to stay in communication from the time that we uh, really turned the dimmer down on in-person visits uh, throughout COVID. And, and one of the, the latest things that we did, aside from uh, sending people kind of a more verbose email about uh, how we uh, continue to see patients in person, is we created an infographic. Um, which we sent to patients because again we want to make the, the, the communication very uh, straightforward. We all know that one of the problems with uh, the way this pandemic has been managed uh, all over the world is that the messaging isn't uh, always as clear as it should be uh, towards patients and, and to be honest citizens. Um, and so maybe uh, we can bring up um, the first page of my in-person infographic. So this is a one pager but I've split it into two. Uh, for the purposes of um, uh, this presentation, so it looks better on the screen. Uh, so we really broke it down into six uh, points. Um, you know, the first thing, the overall, uh, the overarching message to patients is that we want everybody to be safe. Uh, so we want to provide them care, but we want everybody to be safe. I actually think this is page uh, two. So if you can go to the other one, um, there we go, perfect. Uh, so this is page, uh, the, the first part, the top part of the slide, uh, the top part of the infographic. Um, so the, the reminder here is that we're going to see people first uh, by video uh, or by telephone prior to coming, them coming into the office um, and that they can book um, on our website uh, or call the office to book. Um, what we've done, this is a genericized version of what we sent out. We actually have sent it out with the link. Uh, so people could actually click right off the infographic and, and uh, take it, take them right to the, to the website. Uh, we then remind them that uh, they're going to have an in-person consult. Um, if the physician feels uh, or the nurse practitioner feels that they require an in-person visit, and we'll let them know. Um, and that patients will be allowed in the clinic with one caregiver only if needed. And, and some of these learnings, some of the reasons we've included what we've included 
is that as we've left the office open to for in-person visits, um, we've had you know families show up in the waiting room, uh, and so uh, just and you'll see a, a similar comment uh, later on. Um, these are just sort of uh, reminders to our patients uh, that we really want to keep them safe. Um, the next uh, part speaks to the active screening component of seeing people in person. Um, in our office, we're sending them a secure form um, by um, Ocean. Uh, and so the morning of the visit, we ask them to complete this secure form and it actually automatically populates our EMR. So the staff actually can see in the morning uh, who's completed the COVID screening and who hasn't. And for those people who haven't completed the COVID screening, uh, the staff can call them. Um, you can go to the next slide. So the third portion is a reminder to maintain, uh, to obtain mandatory PPE. Um, and that for everybody's safety, we require all patients to wear fabric masks. Um, one of the things that we've realized is that for our hearing impaired patients, we may uh, purchase or we may try to find, because we're not sure where we're gonna get them uh, some masks with a cutout window for the physicians so that those patients, if we do have the hearing impaired patients that need it, will be able to read our lips. Um, and if they're unable to obtain a mask for, for themselves, uh, that they should let us know. Um, this was another uh, learning that we, we came across in the last probably uh, eight to nine weeks, um, which is people uh, really, for some reason, still look to come early to their appointments. Uh, and because we're trying to minimize contact between patients, even though we actually happen to have quite a, a large waiting room that we've redesigned to uh, uh, allow for physical distancing, we really don't want to have anybody in the waiting room um, if they don't need to be there. And so please don't come early and please don't come late for your appointments. And then the last thing, which uh, is very similar uh, in, in thinking about what Sandeep showed with his spaghetti diagram, um, is that in booking follow-up, we want to minimize the amount of people at the reception. And so we're lucky enough that we have, um, we're in a big clinic. We actually have three doors, um, but we have a door that's near our nursing station that we're asking all of our patients to exit through just again to minimize that contact uh, and flow uh, between patients um, and to just either call the receptionist uh, or book online if they need a follow-up visit. Um, obviously, if we realize that we have a patient in the office that uh, is a little more frail or may forget uh, to book that follow-up, we can obviously just call the front desk from the exam room and book the follow-up for them or book the follow-up visit for ourselves uh, ourselves uh, in the exam room with the patient. So just a helpful tool. Um, if people want, uh, we'll make this available as a one pager. It's just a PDF uh, or as a, a JPEG that you can mail email to your patients. Thanks, David. Um, yeah, it would be great if we can, we can, if you give that to us, we'll put it on our website. Um, Perfect. Uh, attendees to access after um, the, the webinar. Uh, there is one question for you about whether you can send a, the link to the office screening form that's sent by a... Um, oh yeah, I'll post, um, I can post the uh, preview of that from Ocean uh, in the chat box now, okay? Fantastic, thanks. Um, so, um, Brian, I think you can end the slide there. And David, I think you've provided us with some great practical info. I'm, um, so continue to put out questions on the chat and the Q&A. Um, and in the meantime, I'm gonna go to our next panelist, Kelly Scott, because um, Kelly, you and your colleagues at in the Southwest, I think have been like particularly proactive in being able to think about the guidance that family doctors on the ground need in order to um, potentially increase the number of visits or see if they can increase the number of in-person visits. Um, and so maybe you could tell me, tell us more, you know, about what you've been hearing on the ground and, and then the tools kit you've developed and kind of what some of the common questions um, you're fielding are right now. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Tara. Um, and actually, David, I, I love that tool that you just shared. So we're going to link it in our resources as well. Um, so in the Southwest Lynn, we have um, a few sub-regional clinical pandemic leads, of which I'm one, and we wanted to, um, rather than sort of start from other um, organizations' guidance, we wanted to start from the questions that our colleagues had. And so we sort of, as a group, thought about our own questions and then compiled the resources that we felt were the best ones and the, and the resources that we were looking at. 
um, and then sort of started that as a, this is the starting base, and then asked our colleagues to continue providing questions and feedback on that to, to make it better. So if you wanna go to the slide of the, um, the Southwest COVID tools website there, we can show you um, this, this link. Um, so it's, it's a guide again to reopening in, in air quotes, because most of us, again, we're not reopening. We have, have been opening, but doing things differently, but more um, relating to ramping up or increasing the in-person visits. Um, if you can just go to the next slide, we started out with the, the red, yellow, green diagram here, um, which um, we had a lot, of, uh, a lot of help to create as well from um, some of the great supports that we have in our Southwest Lynn and a practice facilitation uh, model that we use there. And so um, most of you probably will find that phase one looks very familiar. This is probably what a lot of us have already been doing in person. Um, so, you know, those well baby visits, which again, we had some excellent guidance of what to do in person there from some, from, from some other um, sources. Um, and then things that really required a physical exam that was going to change your management. Um, and as we, as we've hoped, I think, um, we're going to expect that virtual care is here to stay. So as we move from one stage to the next, um, we would be able to add more things in person that may not be as urgent or, um, or um, you know, requiring an in-person visit, but we would just as much as David's doing, you know, recommend offering first a virtual visit to just determine whether an in-person visit was necessary. And the important part here is that really like these arrows between the phases um, is going to depend on your office staff, your availability of PPE, your office configuration. And so it's, it's not intended to be prescriptive, um, but, but as a suggestion compiled by, by us, by family physicians, by nurse practitioners, by primary care clinics that are already working. Um, and the recognition as well that each of you is working in a very different practice model. So some of you are a family physician, but you're also the office manager and you're also the plumber and you're also the person who has to go out and buy, um, buy you know, spots to put on the ground to show where people should stand. And others of you may be employees that are, um, you know, you go in and you do, you do your clinical work and, and you're not sure if the owner or the manager of the clinic is doing things in a, in a way that makes sense. The, all of the resources that have come, come at us from various different organizations are great, um, but you know, sometimes the question that you're looking for is on page 34 of a 37 page document and it's buried in your email from, <clears throat> from a month ago. Um, and, it, and it's very difficult to find and access when you need it. Also, a lot of the information has been directed at you as the physician when really maybe it should have been addressed to your office manager or your clinic management. And so there's been a, <clears throat> excuse me, a reliance to have you pass that information on to those people who make those decisions. So if we could just go back to the um, previous slide, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and if, if Brian, you could just click on the link. Um, we'll give you an example here and click on reopening your offices. <clears throat> and you guys are welcome to explore this website on your own uh, as we're chatting as well. It's just Southwest, so swcovidtools.ca and then you can find that guide. So most of the general guidance that all of you have, have seen or have looked at or um, has been sent to you is in that initial general guidance. And that red, red, yellow, green document is that what in-person visits do I start with link? But then we've just divided it up into um, really your questions. So if you have a question about patient communication, which is where I'm gonna add David's, David's link later, um, you would click there and there's posters, there are other things that you can find there. So again, the idea is every single family doctor's office should not have to invent their own poster. We can, we can compile and share these resources in a way um, that is presented in a way that makes sense for us to find it when we need it. Um, so I'll just, um, we'll, we can have this open and we can maybe use it as, to answer some of your questions as we go on, but I'll, I'll go back to Tara, to Tara and uh, we'll continue on. Thank you. Thanks, Kelly. Um, 
Yeah, so if people, do people have any questions about um, the website? I mean, I think as we're waiting for questions to come in, Kelly, if, I know that you've gotten some common ones. Did you want to take us to a couple of the, the pages that you think uh, people might be particularly interested based on some common questions? Sure. Um, so one of the one of the common questions, and again, we, we developed the tool. We hosted a webinar where we had, had a registration similar to today where people submitted their questions. And many of the questions that you submitted for today were the same questions that that we've been um, we've been answering locally here as well. So one example, David mentioned uh, the request for patients to uh, to bring a mask to the office. So a lot of people are asking, well, what do I do if a patient won't wear a mask? Or am I allowed to charge a patient for a mask? And so those questions have been answered. And I think what, what we're finding as well is that there are questions that have answers and there are questions that, that don't have answers. And so we've attempted to compile where there is an answer, where an answer exists, but there are, the, the questions that we are getting that don't have answers, that's where we that's where we need to turn to our organizations like OCFP and OMA and SGFP to because those are the beginnings of our advocacy questions that we are needing to ask outside of our own, um, you know, or what's already been put out there that people thought we needed to know. Um, and so if you want to scroll down, um, Brian, to um, health and safety, um, and when you click on health and safety, and um, I think if you scroll down to PPE, you're testing me now, I think this is where the answer is. <laughs> so here, for example, we have, how do I know what's good PPE? So if, if you wanna order your own PPE or you're using a different supplier, how do you know what you're getting is actually good PPE? So there's a link there. Um, some of the resources you'll see are Southwest specific, like how to order PPE in our region. Um, or how to report to your public health unit, for example. But um, uh, if we scroll down, I think this is where it is, but no, it might be in the patient visit section. Um, I should have picked an easier example, but if you scroll up a little bit here, you'll see this is a common question as well. What do I need to wear during the office? And so this is a very simple, there's many, many documents that tell you the answer to this question, but this was sort of the simplest, which is, a patient who screens positive and a patient who screens negative and um, sort of giving you the two options there. And we'll, we'll show you another tool a bit later about that. Um, Maybe I can speak yeah. to oh, yeah. Kelly. Um, Jennifer Young was asking about a different regions modifying the Southwest tool with links that are relevant to them. I think that's a, a great idea. Um, you know, one of the, uh, the things that we, uh, have an opportunity uh, to do is use a, a provincial uh, kind of um, uh, web link uh, and then have subdomains and, and maybe that's actually something that we can consider uh, you know having a north south uh, east west in Toronto uh, to mirror the the different now Ontario health regions so that people if there are some specific things that people need like how do I order PPE in my region um, those things could be uh, linked through uh, with the more local guidance and, and, and links. So I think that's a great idea that we can take away from this. Um, maybe I will get one of you guys to answer this question about uh, that you asked Kelly uh, in terms of what do you do if patients don't have a don't want to wear a mask or won't wear a mask. Um, there are actually a couple of other related questions. So one was, can we provide a washable cloth mask for our patients to use in the office as we would a washable gown or drape? Yeah, so, and Brian, I'm not sure if you, if you go back to the, it might be under the patient, um, patient visit section, but, um, so you might be able to find that there, but so the CPSO um, on their Q&A for physicians website um, has answered that question. So rather than just telling you, go check the CPSO website, we've linked the answer for you on, on there. Um, so the, their, their answer is that um, you explain to the patient why it's important to wear a mask, that you're, you know, you're protecting yourself, but other patients in the office, and also you have, you know, as an employer, you need to protect the health and safety of your employees in your office. Um, here's the answer, yes. So the link is there, um, but the CPSO says if the patient declines, you should sensitively explain the explanation of why, the expectation. and um, if you are, if 
depending on their needs and whether or not you're able to safely provide the care, you may, you may defer or reschedule their appointment or redirect them to a different setting. Um, we had a good suggestion on another discussion, you know, some patients with, with anxiety, for example. So maybe asking them, maybe, you know, saying it's really important that you wear the mask at least until I'm in PPE. So like, could you wear the mask until we get to into an exam room so you're not around other patients? And then once we're in the exam room and I'm wearing my PPE, then we could maybe have you take the mask off. And so, so maybe there are ways to mitigate to mitigate that risk. And then the, the CPSO also answered the question about charging patients and they say, no, it's not appropriate to charge, to charge patients. Um, so yes, having um, in our office, I, I think we have um, elected as, as the, uh, the attendee um, asked to, to provide a cloth mask because then you're modeling that. And then now that patient has a cloth mask to wear out in the community or to another, to a repeat visit rather than using disposable masks. But that would be an individual office decision. And the, the CPSO is suggesting that we should not charge patients for masks. So I know that has been a common question. So one of the things that um, we have an open question into the CPSO is whether or not we can provide a cloth mask to patients at cost, meaning not for the individual visit that they're there for, but actually as a public health measure, can we just, in the same way that they'd go to Amazon to buy one, um, but may not know how to navigate that or maybe some other barriers, um, even just making them available in the same way that often, um, you know, other specialties uh, make certain things available. So not so much for the in-person visit that's today, but so that they actually have something when they go to the grocery store or need to take the TTC. David, so more um, on I, that as we hear back. One of the questions though was also about whether, let's say you didn't want to charge the patient, um, but can you still, can you provide, or cloth masks okay to provide to patients to wear, and then you have a system for washing them. I believe that's what Paige uh, is asking about. Yeah, that, that would be okay. And again, there are instructions under um, sanitizing about laundering and how to how to launder them. So again, maybe in your office, you do have uh, laundry facilities um, and, an, and another provider wouldn't and they, that would mean they're taking these masks home to wash. So the, the practicalities of that are gonna be different in everybody's in, in each practice. Great. Um, David, you, uh, there was a question about flu shots. Um, but actually, you know, before we get, there's a few questions on the Q&A and I might get panelists to go to the Q&A to try and answer them. But as we were on the questions about PPE, I thought maybe we'll just stick to that for a moment because I know that there are a lot of questions about PPE. And so maybe what I'll do is I'll, I'll turn it over to Jennifer. Um, and uh, I wonder, Brian, if you can go back to the slides and put up Jennifer's slides about uh, the PPE. And we'll just stick on the PPE um, kind of questions for now. And then I, I do see the other questions about flu shots and other things, and we'll definitely get to those. And if panelists want to answer them in the chat and the Q&A, that'd be great. Thanks, Tara. Uh, this, uh, we've been getting PPE questions for since this all started and we have been giving in office guidance around, around uh, in office visits for those things that we can't, such as immunizations, et cetera. And so what we've done, and this is just hot off the press, we have created a one pager that tries to capture the essence of that. I, I was finding that the, the, the media vision of PPE is the full six point PPE and, and there aren't enough um, images of people wearing just masks, eye protection and hand sanitizers. Um, so I, I, I thought it would be useful to to make an image of, of, of one of us doing what we're doing in our offices rather than just the, the hospital-based PPE image. Um, it's self-explanatory and it has, uh, it's, it, it, um, it, it captures the evidence, the best evidence and advice that is uh, out there um, on the first page. And then the second page, it, which Brian, you can go to, uh, you can go to the second page now um is the is the summary of that um the ministry of health document um around the it, it it's just another way of saying what we had put in that uh, on the infographic uh those who screen negative what is necessary with those who screen positive what is necessary um that uh, that's the uh 
So I hope that's use will be useful, and you are more than welcome to uh, to share that uh, with your patients because there's also an image of a patient wearing a cloth mask, and um, you can put it on websites. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, Brian, I'm also going to ask you, there is a slide that we have up uh, about PPE regional leads, and I just wanted to put that up because there have been some questions about this too. And, and David, I, I wonder if you could answer a little bit about, you know, is PPE being distributed in all regions as it is in the Southwest? And, and yeah. somebody else asked, what is the role of the link going to be in procuring and distributing PPE? So I wonder if you could speak to this slide as you have before. Sure, uh, I'm happy to. So um, a couple of things about PPE. So uh, as many of us know, um, the first thing is that PPE now is mostly is available through many of our traditional channels uh, like Surgeco and Medimart. Um, what most people are finding is that it's much more expensive than it has been in the past and that's not because our local suppliers are gouging, it's because um, market forces are global and there's a global need for PPE and a, and a global shortage. Um, the uh, messaging I think that's most important for all of us to hear um, is that we have to continue putting in orders through our local sources, especially to ensure that, uh, first of all, that the suppliers know what our, uh, exist, what our burn rate is, like how often they are gonna expect us to reorder. Um, that being said, all of the Ontario health regions um, have identified uh, primary care um, as opposed to other areas of medicine for now. Um, as looking after vulnerable patients. And because of that, um, if anybody is experiencing uh, a supply of less than two weeks on any PPE items, uh, we suggest that they get in touch with their local uh, PPE lead for their region. Um, I know that many of the regions have sent out uh, emails with the email contacts for those local PPE leads. Um, and that um, those regions have been supplying sort of emergency amounts of PPE, sort of two weeks at a, two weeks worth uh, to practices. I know that in Toronto, uh, for sure, um, I think we've shipped out to 150 practices in the last two weeks. Um, and in people who have less than sort of a, a five to seven day supply uh, can go through the ministry um, MIOC website uh, for that emergency supply, and that's the people who have less than a week. But obviously, um, you know, that's not sustainable. We can't open our offices and every week uh, worry about uh, running out of PPE. Um, uh, so it's really important that we continue to put orders in. And, and if you're waiting for your order and you're running low, that's a, a, a real um, appropriate uh, use of then uh, going to your Ontario Health Region or the MIOC website and uh, requesting uh, that PPE asked. I'm gonna post a link to the MIOC uh, website in the chat momentarily. Thanks, David. Um, I just note that Ross Kirk Connell, uh, he posted that Guelph Family Health Team has been providing boxes of community donated cloth masks to all practices to give to patients who need them. So just a, a great idea um, uh, that's being done in one community. So thanks for sharing that. Um, uh, another um, individual did ask, and I, I was answered on the on the Q and A. But uh, what which uh, level of reopening are we at right now? And uh, and that unfortunately does depend on where in the province you live. So um, you know, for our, those of us in the GTA, unfortunately, we're still in phase one. Um, for some, many of you outside the GTA or outside, I think Ottawa, um, Windsor, the other hot spots, um, we are now back in. We, they are, as of today, I think, in phase two. So I think that that's important information to keep track of regionally um, as you start to think about what kinds of patients to see. Um, and it uh, also, I, Tara, I would just say as well, it also depends on you and your practice. So, you know, yeah. maybe, maybe you are a solo practitioner with one secretary and you both don't have childcare or, <laughs> you know, maybe you, so you need to provide all your care virtually right now, or, you know, it, it may, it really depends. Um, you know, again, if you're on the 33rd floor of an office building, you're maybe going to have a different, um, you know, pay, incoming of your appointment at your office than you might when you have maybe the option to have a drive through at the back door of your office or who, who you're able to see in your office. So it, it depends on, there isn't a, a rule of, what you should do now and how you should do it. It's, it's really 
dependent on multiple factors. But the focus, of course, is you know, how can you get your patients the care that they need in the, in the most efficient and safest way possible for them and your staff? Thanks, Kelly. Um, I'll also note a comment from um, Rakshi Minocher Homji, who mentioned that their clinic did an order for cloth mask for panelists, for our patients uh, from Canada Sews, and it worked out actually really well. So some great practical tips being shared on the chat line there. Um, David, I think there were a couple of questions on the Q&A that you said you were going to speak to about flu shots and also uh, social distancing in the weight room. Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, interesting question about the social distancing in, in the waiting room. Obviously, we're trying to ensure that we don't get uh, more people than we need to in the waiting room, um, especially if they're, if they're screening positive, like they shouldn't be waiting in the waiting room. If you look at the guidelines uh, that are coming out for other industries, I think it, it, they're quite informative. So uh, I'll pick the guidelines for the theater industry, for instance. So um, we all know that we talk about the respiratory droplets traveling, you know, trying to get make sure that people are, are sort of two meters away from each other um, or uh, three meters if people are singing, <laughs> uh, because we know singing seems to aerosolize a lot. Now, most of our patients are not singing in our waiting room, which is good. Um, but the recommendation um, in the theater industry, which I think speaks to waiting room spaces, is that if you have performers um, on stage who are going to start rehearsing with a mask, um, there should be 14 square feet uh, of space per person. So if you think about wanting to figure out what the maximum capacity would be for your waiting room, think about how many square feet your waiting room is and divide it by 14. Uh, and you could probably divide it by 20 and feel even more comfortable. Um, and, you know, that could become more and more of an issue as we see more and more uh, in-person visits or you have multiple physicians or specialists in an office where it's going to be really difficult to uh, try to minimize how many people are in the waiting room. But it's, not, it's a pretty good uh, hard uh, rule to try to use like the 14 to 20 square foot uh, per uh, persons in the space. Uh, I think the flu shot clinic um, is a really good question. There's a lot of people thinking about this provincially. Um, you know, uh, are we going to use um, our offices? Are we going to use assessment centers? Um, are we going to use our offices for those that can open and then people who don't have sufficient PPE in the fall? Do we have to have an alternate way to immunize patients, including pharmacies, which we know ha have been a big um, a big help in, in recent years. So I think more to come on the flu shots, uh, Amanda, I think that's a great, great question. And lots of people are thinking about it. And we have a, thankfully, a little bit of runway uh, before the uh, flu shot season. Sadeep, um, you, you, there was a question by Will Saxena that I think you were going to um, answer that also relates to social distancing, but also protection of office staff. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, we've Kind of feeling the same thing at the beginning we were all very um very aggressive with the the distancing um as much as we can because of all the uncertainty and i think with with all the social isolation and distancing that's going on there's you know there's a little bit of fatigue going on and we have to be vigilant about trying to keep that up um we had difficulty in our office because our front desk was designed to be you know, really open and we have about 18 feet of open um, counter space, which is really difficult to control for. Um, so we had um, trouble at the beginning sourcing plexiglass shields because everybody was using them and we were just not a priority. Um, so we had to restructure, move the desk back, move the filing cabinets away and try to create that physical distance. Um, but I think it's it's a good point that this, you know, this social distancing fatigue is setting in. We have to be careful that we're not just um, reinventing, but just forgetting these little things that we were all doing well at the very beginning. Um, so the two-meter distancing, I think, from Will's uh, point is, is important. Uh, but as more of our patients come in, and if our screening tools are, you know, I look at the, the guidelines in the OMA yesterday about the, the clinical definition, you know, that's the, the, the number of symptoms that are on there like a regular day in the office. Um, so it becomes an issue of trying to figure out where that screening tool um, becomes useful and what our what our guidelines a face mask now as we see more and more patients or shield or goggles at least um, I think are important I 
Thanks, Tara. Um, internet and turn it over to analysts. I think Tara is saying that she's having some connectivity issues there. I'm not sure if uh, hopefully everyone can hear me. So I'm just taking a look at some of the other questions and uh, the other panelists can do the same here. Yeah, so um, there's some questions here about whether or not um, some of the resources we've shared um, can be downloaded or used, of course. So um, some of the links are posted in the chat or the Q&A, but um, many of them are linked on the website that I showed you, um, www.swcovidtools.ca and also the OCFP website. Um, and we'll, we'll share them as well. And... Kelly, there's a question here about um, diverting patients with respiratory symptoms. Um, and I think that that question becomes to what we've talked about is is what your comfortability is and what your status is and what your individual um, office ability is. Um, if we try to do that in our small two person kind of clinic, I'd run out of my PPE you know, very very quickly um, trying to see that kind of patient. So we've had to divert, um, but we we do screen them all and then. A lot of them haven't needed to go to hospital. It's just been regular check-ins to just to see and follow um, their condition. But yes, we've in our office we've had to divert them because we just weren't able to physically um, control for it. I think yeah, sorry really that I lost stability in my internet connection there, but I'm back now. Um, I just wanted to just uh, make a couple of comments there that um, I, and it, forgive me if people have said this already, if you have resources, please do um, share them in the all panelists and all attendees. So, so don't just send it to us as the panelists, but make sure you click all attendees as well. We've loved the resources coming in. And I also wanted to just confirm that we are going to be sending out um, an, a link to where our, we house all of our webinars and resources, and also we'll include some of the resources directly in an email that we send to you when we uh, just following probably early next week, Monday or Tuesday. Sorry, David. Uh, yeah, no, it's just two things. I was just going to say, I, I did share just now for people who need to make critical PPE requests, the link uh, for the province is there. It doesn't matter where in the province you practice, you, it'll um, divert the, um, the request to the right area to make sure it gets to you. Um, I think there, this question about um, upper respiratory tract infections, symptomatic patients, uh, I think there's going to be truly a regional approach to this. I think it's going to, as, as Sandeep was suggesting, it's going to be about uh, people's comfort. Um, I, I could imagine a situation where practices twin with one another, depending on, um, it, you could have a, a practice where there are physicians, for whatever reason, are at higher risk, uh, are developing uh, a bad COVID infection, and they may feel less comfortable in seeing these patients. And uh, if they share, if they're in the same flow and they share an EMR, um, they could share, you know, coverage for these patients. I, I think that there's going to be a lot of local mm -hmm. solutions, and, and I would hope that people start sort of engaging in uh, with their colleagues around what's the safest way to see these patients and make sure that we care for them. So I think, thank you. I think there's been a number of questions in the chat box around that. Um, and then the only other one I wanted to answer um, uh, is uh, I think this comment about social distancing for staff in non-clinical areas. I think it's a really important question. We're seeing it in the hospital, um, you know, even around like, how do I eat lunch safely uh, or take a break safely? Um, you know, I, I know some hospital staff that are going to their car to eat because they feel just so anxious about taking their mask off. Um, but I do think that a policy of masking, if you're not in your own private office where you can close the door, um, <clears throat> makes a lot of sense. You know, people can use the same mask uh, for um, most of the day, uh, most of the morning and another one for most of the afternoon. Uh, we may find that our, our staff, that if they're on the phone a lot, their mask could get wet. So, you know, remind staff that if the mask is wet, that they should replace it. But I do think that a, a, a policy of universal masking when you're indoors 
and maybe close to other patients or other people, sorry, other people makes a lot of sense. Thanks, David. Um, I wanted to just take a moment to also share, um, you know, a framework that I've uh, written about that has helped me think about a little bit as we balance in-person and virtual visits moving forward. And I think this relates to some of the questions that have been coming up. Brian, I wonder if you can put up the slide on um, considerations for in-person visits, the, uh, the infographic blog. Um, so basically, I, I wrote a blog at CMAJ that uh, I can share the link for. So it's just, I think, the slide just before this. Perfect. And I think a lot of us have been focusing today in our call on um, you know, safety considerations related to COVID, and that's very appropriate. So of course, um, we can't, uh, you know, see peace people in person if we can't ensure the safety of our staff and patients. Um, but I think this is also an opportunity as we think moving forward, um, you know, there's been different ways in which we can think about who we see. And, and for me, using um, this kind of framework helps me think about it too. I think some of our other previous community of practice calls actually have highlighted to me other safety issues. Um, so, for example, um, uh, patient safety issues of misdiagnosis, uh, including, for example, in a previous call, we've talked about, you know, the potential of missing something like domestic violence. Of course, there are phys physical conditions that we may be missing. Uh, we talked about how, uh, how mental health care is a reason. So if somebody is acutely suicidal, that may be a reason to see them in person. So just to consider other safety considerations, uh, my colleague, Bill Watson, who, who um, He's a, has been in practice for many, many years, has reminded us many times of the new cancer diagnoses or other um, really um, uh, important illnesses that he's picked up because he's seen people in person. Um, I think that there is a great comment on the chat from Rachel Labonte about how also sometimes, you know, do, she got a comment from a doctor that sometimes we are providing a lot of care that's probably unnecessary to worried well and not enough to other populations. And I think that's where an effectiveness and equity lens come in. Um, I, I love there's a hyperlink to an article there um, from Canadian Family Physicians that talks about the layers of evidence of the different kinds of visits we see. So, of course, there's a lot of evidence for uh, 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 we can, we can provide a lot of value for a lot of acute care conditions, um, also treating some chronic diseases that are unstable, um, less value for stable chronic conditions, and of course, even, and even less kind of mortality and morbidity value when it comes to preventive health care. And so we probably have to think about that tier in terms of the value back of, of who, the kinds of treatment we're providing. Um, and then from an equity perspective, we know that not everyone obviously can access um, virtual tools in the same way, um, but at the same time for other people, virtual tools actually may be more, uh, more helpful. And the last one I, I do want to want to just point out is around efficiency, because I think this is where a lot of us moving forward, um, there may be, a, there's going to be a mix of in-person and virtual visits in a way that we haven't done before so 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 that we can minimize for the amount of in office time so I already know a lot of people are doing for well babies they're doing all of the pre visit questions virtually and then bringing them in just for the immunizations to minimize the amount of time that they're in the waiting room. And so potentially coming into contact uh, with other patients and with staff. Um, so that's an example of just trying to be uh, very efficient. And then the, around the efficiency of PPE use, I think this is where we've heard from physicians who are pooling together so that one physician is designated in the clinic to see um, all of the in-person visits uh, uh, that are urgent for that uh, half day. And that might be uh, a strategy that, for example, we talked about URIs. I know our COVID assessment center is not going to be assessing people for URIs. Um, and so we need to be able to uh, accommodate that. Um, and the way we're doing it right now is by trading off and having one physician uh, see uh, uh, urgent patients for a number. Um, but that, of course, as, as David mentioned, is most important for, uh, uh, it is probably going to be very regional in nature. Um, Great. I would also just uh, add, Tara, that the for yeah. both access and the patient-centeredness. So the, there is also the flip side of this where we are actually increasing access for a lot of people and, and increasing the patient-centeredness by being able to provide phone and virtual visits. So I've certainly had some patients who, you know, I could not for the life of me get them to come in to do their diabetes follow-up, um, but, you know, I can email them a lab rec and um, I can have a, a meeting like this with them while they're at work um, and they're not having to take the whole day off. Even, even myself trying to access medical care, um, you know, not having to cancel a whole day uh, or half day of patients to be able to go to an appointment. Um, so the, um, there are the benefits and um, um, it's, it's not all, um, all risk. 
Thanks, Kelly. Um, I do also want to flash up another slide um, uh, just uh, prior to this one, Brian, I think it is. Um, you know, we've, we've shared a lot of links. These are some other official links. We didn't, we, we, we debated whether to share all of these links um, because I think they can be overwhelming for people. Um, I think the Ontario College of Family Physicians website and the Southwest Lynn's website that we looked at today actually does amalgamate many of these, but if um, these are some of the official links uh, from Ontario um, and BC Family Doctors was actually one of the first out with some very practical guidance for family doctors. Um, uh, Jennifer, did you want to say something in response to uh, Rachel Labonte's comment? Um, yeah, sure, it does, uh, it does dovetail with your comment around the levels of, of effective care and, uh, and uh, choosing wisely is, is, uh, is helping to guide us around high value care and I think we need to, to look, re-look at what it is we do, there are, there are and have been um, there has been lots of discussion around the annual health exam and, and is that really necessary at all? Targeted, targeted patient-centered interventions are, are more effective. Um, I would like to speak a little bit to the, uh, the screening, the preventive care around screening and, and, um, and I know that David, maybe you could give us a little bit of a heads up around when regular PAPs will be done and FIT will be done. Even though screening is, uh, has a number needed to screen for benefit at a relatively low level compared to helping somebody with their gout uh, that will obviously help them immediately, there is value to doing PAPs regularly and doing the FIT FOBT. Um, the that that is important so i'd like to hear from david about when that'll be available but also with regards to the uris this is a perfect opportunity for us to reduce the antibiotics that we are that it, that we're using and to help people with self-management around viral illnesses i know i don't need to spend 50 percent of my day looking at people who have viral illnesses i'm sure that that it's not the best use of our expertise. So I think uh, this is an opportunity and I think already patients are, are taking the opportunity to self-manage and, and, and watch and wait their viral illnesses rather than, rather than immediately seeking care for them because the vast majority of respiratory illnesses are, are, will not require antibiotics and, and will get better hopefully at, at managing uh, those virtually and saying, I'll need to see you if this happens and having, having a good sense of you know, what triggers you to think somebody might have a, a need for an antibiotic just based on history, not based on a physical examination. That physical Thanks. examination, there are yeah. very few of them. Well, I won't say very few, but there's, there's gonna be the majority of your, of your viral illnesses that you'll be able to manage on the phone without having to do a physical exam. Yeah. Um, Brent, can you go back to the blog slide and I'll let David speak to briefly um, because I know we only have a couple more. Yeah, minutes. absolutely. So all I would say is that uh, Ontario Health, uh, which now has uh, Cancer Care Ontario as, as one of the units, um, needs to decide when to restart uh, its $80 million provincial cancer screening program. It's a, it's a huge program. Um, and part of it, obviously, is that we need to ensure that there is the capacity in the system across the system, because it is a provincial uh, program, to uh, deal with the uh, additional testing that could come out of routine screening, um, mu much of which obviously comes back uh, normal. And so, you know, I know is even in our own hospital that's ramped up uh, colonoscopies, for instance, we're doing colonoscopies in symptomatic patients. And... Uh, as I was speaking with one of the nurses yesterday, she was telling me that lo and behold, they're finding a lot more cancers because the colonoscopies they're doing are on symptomatic patients. So um, I think uh, we're going to hear more about it as the whole system starts, the dimmer switch starts to come back up. Um, uh, but I think it's a great question. I'm sure it gives us a lot of anxiety as clinicians because we want to do right by our patients. Um, but I think it speaks to um, that piece around consider the evidence on the gradient of therapeutic be benefit that uh, Dr. Kieran has on her slide. Um, and we definitely have a lot of people and a lot of interventions that we need to do 
um, where there's a lot of therapeutic benefit uh, and seeing those people in uh, in person, but uh, I think we'll be able to communicate hopefully in the near future uh, around the provincial uh, cancer screening program. Thanks, David. Yeah, and, you know, we, sometimes we have more questions than answers, unfortunately, and we're working through this together. Uh, you know, just briefly, I think as we're balancing these uh, virtual in-person uh, visits, the other thing I, I'd highlight on this blog is just thinking about what data to collect in your practice that might actually help to guide you. And some of that includes, you know, things like, uh, you know, just reflection on the day and, and with staff about potential incidents that have occurred as an example. I'm going to go to the last slide there, Brian, because I know we're at time and I, I think we've had just an amazing discussion today. Um, and I want to thank all of our panelists, um, Sandeep, David, uh, Ben Watt, David Kaplan, Kelly Scott, Jennifer Young, uh, for contributing. Thank you for sharing all of the fantastic links. As we mentioned, uh, we will be um, putting the webinar recording up on our website. So the, the website, uh, dfcm.utoronto.ca, COVID-19 Community of Practice. Uh, we'll have the website recording as well as a compilation of some of the resources that were shared today. We will also email those out to you early next week. Um, you should be getting your main pro certificate uh, emailed to you in a, in a couple of weeks following uh, the webinar today. Um, and uh, stay tuned in two weeks. Uh, we will have uh, another webinar uh, and we will be announcing that one shortly. So thank you so much for joining us today. Um, stay safe and be well. Thank you.